really proud to be uh, here and to be offering you guys some insights into this whole new genre of camera that's kind of come out and taken the industry by storm. Um, and again, one thing, I, ha I do have it broken up. I'm gonna go over each sort of camera um, or camera company and at the end of, before I go on to the uh, next one, I will ask if there's any questions. So let's hold it till then and uh, we won't move forward until we get it resolved. And um, I'll also be repeating the question too so that everyone can hear what's going on. Let's do this. All right. Um, so I think it was about three years ago, um, I um, was traveling. I traveled for B&H. And, &H, and um, I, my DSLR was stolen. So unfortunately, I just bought a brand new lens for it. Maybe I got 30 shots out of it. And kapoof, it's gone. Now, I'm fortunate enough to work at B&H, so I do have access to play with a lot of cameras. But I am also, you know, I shoot a lot. So having the right camera is, is, a, is a, a, a very important thing for me that it does exactly what I need it to do and that I have it when I need it, not when it's available in the cage or something like that. Um, so I played around with some of the offerings um, that were out there. Um, but when the Fuji X series kind of came out, that was a, a really good mix for me. Now, I don't, I'm not going to say, a lot of you have already asked me, what is the best camera out there? There is no best camera, okay? Just like when we're dating, it's about finding what your needs are, what, what, you, know, what, you're, what you like to improve upon, and then finding a perfect match. A lot of these cameras that I'm going to talk about are going to be on the upper tier of the, um, of the mirrorless cameras, because some, some of these companies have like about 10 different types of mirrorless cameras. And from entry level to the really uh, pro professional versions. I'm going to really focus mostly on the ones that I feel can compete with SLRs. So about making our shoulders a little bit better, right? Taking a couple pounds off the shoulders. This is a picture of me last year. I did two trips to, um, I, went, I went to Scotland, took my mother to Scotland. And then I took uh, my wife, where was a wedding in Turkey. So I did two trips with that Fuji X Pro 1. That's my setup right there. How many of us usually travel, we have backpacks? Right? A lot of, and have we, how many, right? We have lots of lenses in there. We have lots of tripod, we have a tripod, all these sort of accoutrements. That was my go-to bag right there. That's the Think Tank Retrospect bag. And that's their smallest one. And it is the perfect bag, besides this, also this Tenba, mini messenger bag that I have up here. Those I think are the perfect bags for mirrorless cameras because you could stick one or two bodies in there and about three to five lenses and not have any really, it doesn't, A, they don't, neither of them look like bags and, and you, know, you know, it's also you can put it in such a small little profile. Also note, I have a little, just a little tabletop tripod there too. I was able to kind of, those traveler tripods, I was just able to easily load that up on top. But I travel so much that, for me, the mirrorless was the answer. You know, that was the perfect camera for me to have. Um, I, it also breathes life uh, into a lot of my old lenses. I have old Voigtlander, old Leica lenses and stuff like that. And, and now I can sort of go use those lenses again. And now we're going to talk about some of the adapters. And almost every camera does have adapters to kind of access maybe some of our older lenses or maybe some of our SLR lenses. You know, if you're a Nikon user and you want to get the Nikon mirrorless or Canon want to use the, the Canon mirrorless, they do make adapters for that. So how many, so let me ask a couple questions uh, from you guys. First off, um, how many here have, have uh, seen me lecture on the night photography before? All right, welcome back. I see definitely some familiar faces. So yeah. right, I do also, uh, my main talk here at b &H is the night photography talk and I do also do local workshops around. So you can always follow my travels and adventures via my blog, which is ruinism. Dot com, okay. <laughs> and um, so let me ask you guys a couple questions. How many here? How many people here already own a mirrorless camera? Okay, so quite a bit. Are you happy? Are we happy with our mirrorless cameras? Yeah, excellent. Right. How many people here own uh, a mirrorless and a DSLR? Okay. How many people just DSLRs? And how many no DSLRs, no mirrorless? Okay, excellent. It's good to see. I think, you know, there's lots of answers. The mirrorless can answer 
Some of them will answer more point and shoot, are wonderful bridges for those of us who want maybe a point and shoot or at least a better point and shoot. And the mirror, there are some types that, of, of mirrorless cameras that answer that question. But I think there's definitely a lot of ones out there that are, again, like I said, competing heavily in image quality wise <laughs> with the uh, DSLRs. So what is a mirrorless camera? The newest generation of digital cameras, somewhere sandwiched between point and shoots and SLRs. Um, kind of if, uh, any, how many people, I forgot to ask, how many people here um, own a rangefinder camera? And it can be over 50 years old, that's fine. There we go. <laughs> so, oh, oh, one quick uh, trivia question. Who here knows what the first mirrorless camera was? Extra points for what year, too? Canon? No Canon. Canon was, la Canon was the last to the party. What's that? Panasonic is the easy answer, but it is incorrect. No, before, wait, it was in 2004. It is Epson. Does anyone remember the Epson RD4? No, it lasted for a year, and it was a, a kind of, it was a cool design, it almost, it looked like a Leica. And it was the first rangefinder with a sensor inside of it. And Epson, I, I don't know whose technology it was, but Epson branded it, the R, RD1 was the name of it. And like I said, it lasted for about a year, but it had a few clunks and it was, and it was pricey. You know, I think it was like $3,000 or something like that at the time. Uh, which, you know, well, when you're competing with Leica, that's half off. <laughs> so, um, it took about, uh, I think in 2006, Leica came out with their um, M8, which was their first digital camera. Now, I'm not going to really talk about Leica because I feel um, that I still put them, call me classic, but I, I still put them in the range finder category, okay? I, even though they are mirrorless, but they're all in a category, I believe, all in their own. No, none of these other cameras that I'm going to talk about are over geez, are over $1,200, right? And then like, and the Leica digital cameras start at about 6,000. So I think, you know, you could, I'm gonna call them still digital rangefinders. Um, if we, we're gonna have a hot debate online about that, that's fine. <laughs> but it wasn't, 2008 was really when mirrorless started to gain steam. And it was Panasonic who came out with their first camera and Olympus together that kind of created the micro four thirds consortium and, uh, so Panasonic was the first, and then Olympus right on after that with their Pen series. Um, again, started in 2008, Panasonic Olympus. The main thing with these is these are cameras that are s as small as point-and-shoot cameras, but they have the, the, the um, flexibility of a DSLR. They have interchangeable lenses, okay? How many of us have had our point-and-shoot cameras and we press our little zoom dial and you're like, uh-oh, can't zoom anymore, or can't get wide enough, or you know, we're just limited by the camera about what, what our zoom length is. So the beauty of these uh, mirrorless cameras is that we can kind of pick and choose a lens that fits our needs, okay? Um, also, the sensor sizes got much bigger. You know, the sensor size for most uh, point-and-shoot cameras is smaller than your pinky nail. Okay, most of these on the uh, most of the mirrorless <laughs> cameras are, are going to be, or a good uh, a good portion of them are going to be almost as big as a DSLR, APS-C size sensor, or as big as a DSLR, and then a little bit smaller than that. So better image quality with those bigger sensors. They are made smaller because of the main thing is they got rid of sort of the pentaprism, the mirror chassis. Okay, it's a funny thing. Digital just kind of came along, right, and all the manufacturers, they really just, the way I look at it is they just said, okay, digital, we'll put a digital sensor where that film used to go. But it was companies like Olympus and Panasonic that said, hey, we, we don't have a SLR already. We can start from scratch and build a real, true, digital machine. Why do we need these mirrors? That, we don't need those. Most people are shooting like this. And we can go and we can kind of try to capture an audience that likes a smaller frame. Okay, so 
that, that's been the biggest move with them and very, very popular is no mirror um, and uh, using a, either the back of the screen or using electronic or optical viewfinders. Like I said, small on size, but big on image quality. So, I'm, I'm using the word mirrorless a lot, but I actually should be using the word evil. Because there's only one camera out on the market that makes this whole group mirrorless. Otherwise, they all are using electronic viewfinders, the evil, okay? Um, so, the only one, so this is what you'll see. Most, <coughs> most of the cameras are not even gonna have an electronic viewfinder built in. Most of them you'll just be using the back of the screen, like a point-and-shoot camera. Most, I would say 95% of the point-and-shoot cameras on the market, none of them have a viewfinder, whether it be optical or electronic. I would say with the mirrorless cameras or the evil cameras, I would say about 80% of them do not have an electronic viewfinder. You'll be using the back of the screen. That can be troublesome in sunny days. Okay, so whether we are using a loop or most of the companies do have an optional electronic viewfinder or at least another model up the step, up in the tier that will help solve that issue. I'll also say one thing, you know, de uh, definitely shooting like this, as much as we do it and I find myself doing it, is not as stable as shooting like this, okay? We can almost create a tripod with our arms when we kind of brace them closer to ourselves. So it is more natural to be holding it up to our eye and looking through that. Okay, it's the Fuji that kind of makes us, and it's the Fuji X Pro One that makes the whole group of these really called mirrorless because they have a very unique, um, a hybrid viewfinder which can toggle between optical and electronic. Optical viewfinder is just looking through this piece of glass right here, so it's almost like using a rangefinder. For those of us who, who used rangefinders, you'll you'll see your lens in it, but you'll also see the rest of the uh, rest of the scene. You'll often see more than the scene, and there's a wonderful overlay, you know, in the scene. So you can kind of what I like about this optical viewfinder, it's brighter than any electronic viewfinder. So if you are shooting in dim situations and low light situations, this is a great camera. And when you switch to op the optical viewing, okay. Um, you can easily toggle it to electronic viewfinder because the problem with the optical is it's about 90% accurate. That little line that shows you what's in the image. So if you're really, you don't want like that garbage bag that just blew into the scene or something like that into the scene, you can quickly toggle between 100% viewing in electronic or going to 90% viewing in optical. Another nice thing in the optical is that you can see the action coming into the scene. Right? Because you're looking actually at a bigger picture and then you have your overlay, you can actually see the action come into the scene and know precisely when to click the image. Okay? But they're the only camera out there that offers that feature to it. They have an X100S that has that as well. It's not a mirrorless camera because there has no interchangeable lenses, but it is a, still a dandy of a camera, same, uh, same sensor inside, same wonderful uh, image quality, okay? Let's just talk a little bit about uh, the differences, again, between um, the uh, mirrorless and the SLR. So how do we get them that small? And that's basically gonna be because of the flange to film difference. Most of you guys, are almost on every camera, let me see if I can see it. Well, I guess almost every SLR camera there's on the top of your camera, there'll be like a circle with a line through it, okay? And that's telling you basically where your sensor is, where it rests. It doesn't rest all the way in the back. You know, you gotta make room for that LCD screen. So basically that's telling you the difference from where, you know, the light's gonna come in and how long it's going to uh, take to hit your, um, you hit the sensor. So look, at here's our, here's our uh, DSLR over here. It goes through the optics of the lens and then it goes through when we're focusing, it's gonna hit a mirror, go up to the, the pentaprism, get flipped back around so we can see it right side up. So it's doing a lot of traveling, right? And for those of you, you know, so 
if we, if we now, with mirrorless cameras, they are putting the technology right on top of the sensor. So we're just looking right through there. We're getting rid of all that mirror right there. So we can now make that camera much smaller. Again, not only can we make the body smaller, but the lenses can be smaller as well. So they, again, I'm showing you this bag that I could, I could probably fit about eight lenses in here, as well as one camera body or two camera bodies and about six lenses. You know, we would need a backpack if that was going to be a, you know, a DSLR. Here's sort of Canon's, uh, like a, a, a good looking at what the size difference. Here's their mirrorless right here, the, the EOS M. Then we have their 70, which is sort of a normal size. APS-C, same size sensor and both of these cameras. But look at the size difference. And then there's their Pro one right there. So if you, if you look at it, just they, they got rid of the pentaprism, right? And they're just focusing sort of on that sensor and the guts of it. Because there's no mirror flapping up and down when we take the picture, all mirrorless cameras are inherently quieter. Okay, so if you're shooting, you know, in theaters or sports or places where you have to be quiet, a mirrorless, cancer is a, a mirrorless camera is a good um, option. I find them quite, very intuitive. I've been able to test all the cameras that you're going to see today in this presentation, um, and I didn't read the manual in any of them. Okay, I, I wanted to test them to see how intuitive it was. And some are definitely more menu driven than others, and I'll talk about that. Okay, because I find that a little frustrating sometimes, okay? Unless I'm familiar with that menu, okay? One of the great benefits, and I, I realize this, especially when I'm traveling, is that you don't look like a pro with these cameras. People are not taking you seriously. People are, you, go, you can go into, you know, a museum or a church or somewhere else like that when you're traveling, and people are not gonna be like, oh, put that away. They think it's a point shoot camera. They don't, you know, and so you can, Go and get your, your great shots and don't have to worry about people, you know, poo-pooing you, okay? There are definitely a lot of automated features, um, but all, all of these have a lot of manual control with them as well, okay? So you can always, almost all the cameras here, you can operate in full manual mode if you need to, but then a lot of them have a lot of fun filters like toy filters and, you know, all these sort of creative filters out there. And all of them shoot raw. Okay, that's an always an important feature is that we want to get the most out of our image quality. So a lot of them will shoot JPEG, JPEG and raw, or just raw. Okay. Let's look a little bit, let's talk a little bit about sensors um, and sensor size. And uh, I got, was able to get this off of the website. This, I really enjoyed this. This is from digicamdb.com. I thought you did a great job of showing us the sensor sizes as well as showing them sort of what cameras fit into this. Um, the first group is this, the one and two thirds sensor, and that's pretty much the size of point and shoot cameras. And uh, Pentax is making that with their Q and Q10, and Ricoh with their GXR P10. Um, those cameras are sort of going away. Pentax now just released the Q7. It's, it's this, this, this camera that you can get in, I think, two or 200 or 2,000 different colors. <laughs> so, like I said, I'm going to talk more about the Pro ones. That one is a fun camera to have, um, and their sensor size got bigger on that. Um, the, for the smallest sensor that I will consider is going to be the one-inch sensor, and that's by Nikon, their CX mount, and that's with their J1, V1, V2, J, you know, series. Um, Four-thirds, and you can kind of see the, the, the millimeter square difference on it, uh, as well as the crop factor. So micro four thirds, which is Olympus and Panasonic, okay? They have a, a nice easy one, two times factor. So a 50 millimeter lens equals 100, right? So it's easy for us to kind of figure out what the, um, the 35 millimeter or full frame equivalent is. So that's a, another thing is a lot of these sensors are smaller, so they'll help us get closer to farther away objects inherently, okay? Um, we move up from the uh, four-thirds to the APS-C size uh, sensor, um, and those are being used by Canon, by Fuji, by Sony. And that's pretty much the biggest one on the mirrorless uh, market. There is not a full-frame one yet. Um, Sony has their RX1 camera, which, kind of like the Fuji X100S, 
I don't consider it a mirrorless camera because it does not have an interchangeable lens. It has a built-in lens only, okay? 35, both cameras actually have a 35 millimeter focal length. That camera is also $3,000. <laughs> it's a nice camera, but I'm not gonna really focus on that one today. And then of course the, the Leica too has the full frame, finally. Here's another kind of look at it right here. And now we can kind of really get a good grasp of sensor size. Um, and that point shoot camera is that first little box, that one and two thirds. Look at how much bigger APS-C is, right? So what do we get with bigger sensors? You know, almost all these cameras are, are hovering around 16 megapixels, okay? 16 million pixels. You can either cram them into a sensor that's, you know, one inch or one and two thirds inch or something like that, or we can give them some nice wiggle room and an APS-C size sensor or something larger than that. Um, the more room you give them, the larger the, the actual sensors can, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sensors can be, right? Uh, the pixels can be, and uh, that you, you're gonna get better image quality. You're gonna get better, higher ISOs and less uh, image noise from it altogether, okay? And then finally, there is a, a lot of adapters out there. Um, both, you know, mo almost every uh, mirrorless camera is making adapters to fit other cameras. A couple people asked me about, what about my old Leica lenses? Leica is probably the most adaptable lens out there for almost any camera, whether it be Olympus, Panasonic, Fuji, how, uh, however yeah. you want. Novaflex is a big uh, mount, uh, mount adapter, as well as, like I said, most of the other ones will do it. Uh, Canon and Nikon will make adapters for their specific lenses to their smaller mirrorless cameras. This is a new one that just came out. Um, it's called Metabones, and B&H just started carrying them about a month ago. They have two types of adapters. They just have a standard adapter, if, which usually runs about, most of these adapters are gonna run somewhere between 150 and about $250, okay? Depending upon build quality, Novaflex is typically the most expensive. Uh, but they have really, uh, they're really well made. Um, Metabones is about 150, but they have a very unique adapter called their Speed Booster, okay? And this is totally new to the industry. Their Speed Booster is a wide angle converter, okay? We have teleconverters, right, in the SLR word, in the SLR world, which will make our, our uh, lenses go farther, right, by one time, so by 1.5 times or two times, but this is really the first wide angle adapter. And basically it'll um, increase your maximum aperture by one stop. So if I put on a 50 millimeter uh, 2.8 lens on there, I'm, it's actually gonna be a 50 millimeter 2.0 lens. Not only does it do that, but it actually, um, uh, makes the lens wider by 0.71x. So a lot of these that we're adapting have that um, 1.5 or sometimes two times conversion. For the ones that you're converting to an APS-C, it's gonna bring it back to just exactly what that lens was, which that is really great, especially for those uh, Leica users who have wide angle lenses, like a 21 millimeter, a 28 millimeter, or a 35, that they would like to keep it that and not have it go like a 35 to a 50 millimeter with a 1.5 conversion. So this, this brings it back. And finally, the third thing that this uh, adapter does is that it actually increases the MTF, which is like their basically image quality. I don't know how it does that, probably fairy dust, but uh, these are really interesting. They cost about $500, so they're, they're definitely a little bit more. But for those of us who have those wide angle lenses that we wish to ad adapt, to these mirrorless cameras, that's probably one of the best adapters out there. Okay? Meta Bones, Speed Booster. Okay, another major um, discourse that goes on with uh, mirrorless cameras is the focusing. A lot of, the, now, some of them were now in our eighth generation, and some of them when they first came out, a lot of the first gens were a little bit slower to focus, okay? They were using a uh, contrast 
detection focus, which is common in point-and-shoot cameras. They were not using phase detection, which is very co common in SLRs. And so here's the breakdown of them. You know, is one better than the other? It depends what the scene is. And the beauty, what's happening, what we're seeing now, is most of the mirrorless cameras are going forward with a hybrid focusing technology where the camera is detecting what is going on in the scene. Is it low light? If it's low light, you know, I'll use this type of, uh, this type of focusing. If, it's, if I see action, I'll use this type of focusing. So that's where sort of the future is going with this and um, almost all models are up to spec on this one or at least improving what they already have, their contrast or phase. But here's sort of the breakdown. Autofocus speed, phase detection, which you'll find in SLRs, it's gonna be real, it's gonna be faster. It's gonna lock on and track it a little bit faster than contrast. Contrast is a little bit better in low light and is a more accurate at wider open apertures. So if you shoot at 2.8, if you shoot at 1.8, if you shoot at 1.4, sort of that, the more open end of your lens, contrast is, a little, is definitely more accurate than phase. Okay, and again, it works in low light. There is a little, because there's a mechanism in there for uh, a sort of a moving mechanism for the phase detection, um, there is some uh, margin for error in the accuracy. So, you know, it said one isn't really better than the other, it depends what, what you're shooting, what scene. As I said, the evolution is hybrid AF. All right, which camera is right for you? Now I want you to pay special attention to these slides because I have a different hat on in each one of them. <laughs> um, I'm gonna do, we're gonna do this alphabetically, no judgment, okay? So Canon, which we have the Canon right up here. Canon was the, uh, even though they're the first in the presentation, they were last to the party. <laughs> they were the last company to kind of come out with a mirrorless camera, um, which is kind of, I, everyone was kind of clamoring for them. What, you know, they were saying, hey, why has everyone else got these smaller cameras? Canon only makes heavy cameras. <laughs> but um, this is called the EOS, EOS M, okay? And it uses a 18 megapixel CMOS sensor, okay? It is the APS-C, 1.6 crop. Most APS cameras are 1.5, but Canon's APS has always been 1.6, so just a little bit more. Um, it uses a hybrid focusing, contrast and phase. It has a new mount called the EOS M mount, okay? It is, uh, ISO range is gonna be 100 to 12,800. It has a fixed touch screen, three inch touch screen screen and it does not have stabilization, okay? Right now, um, this camera is from is 349 or 399, depending upon how you get it. When it came out um, in July of 2012, it was about $800, okay? So it has significantly dropped and it's really tough for, for, the, for those Canon users out there it's right now, it's a, it's a good time sort of to get it. There are up to $250 rebates going until 831 to kind of make it that really, I mean, that's, that's cheaper than some point and shoot cameras, <laughs> right? So let's get into some more of the uh, basics of, of what, is, what it has to offer. Um, right now, it has the least amount of lenses available to it. it I put three lenses, it really only has two lenses because it looks like the third lens that uh, Canon released is not gonna be coming to the United States for some reason. So I believe an 11 to 18, so it's sort of a super wide. But for some reason, as of right now, it's in Japan and it's in Europe, but it's not in the United States. Um, these lenses are an STM autofocus, which is a, a silent autofocus, which is excellent for uh, shooting movies, video. Okay, it's not gonna go it's very silent, STM. A lot of Canon lenses are applying this same focusing to their DSLR lenses. Um, I feel that this camera has the best touchscreen on, on the market right now. It is incredibly responsive when you, want, when you need it to be and not responsive when it shouldn't be, which I think is a, a great thing. But the interface, that UI experience, you don't have to dig a lot. Um, there aren't a lot of controls here. You, um, but they, Canon does make it simple in their menu system to kind of go around. And a couple of you asked that, uh, 
you know, a lot with these cameras, a lot of times what you can do is you can kind of point to something and that's going to be where it focuses. So we can choose to either, it's going to take the picture when it gets in focus or it's going, we can use the trigger up here, which is kind of like a sly way to shoot. It's got the uh, excellent EOS movie features in it. It's going to shoot HD, um, 1080 um, HD on it. So great, great, um, Ken is sort of known for their video quality. There is no flash on this camera. There is a hot shoe, so you can either add um, one of your, um, already one of your flashes, your Canon flashes, or they do sell this cute little flash. Again, flashes will get smaller, lenses will get smaller, the whole thing. So these are the two lenses that are available for it, but it also does sell an adapter. And here's their adapter, $150. And here is a Canon 10 to 22 lens. So we can kind of put that on the camera. Now, of course, you know, you have to, uh, putting a 70 to 200 2.8 lens <laughs> probably makes, you know, these, uh, these cameras a little bit, uh, you know, less. Uh, yeah, exactly. So there's some lenses that it fits good, and there's some that, do that it doesn't. So this one is not that bad. <laughs> but as you can see, like here's almost the same, that's very similar range in lenses. Okay. I believe the adapter is $150. Okay. What size do you have the lens? Uh, it's the, the, the two lenses, I believe, are a 10 to, uh, there's a fixed, this is a pancake lens, which is a 22 right here. And then this one right here is a uh, 18 to 55. There are no viewfinder options right now for it. It is just the back of the screen. There's no electronic viewfinder, okay? So if you're gonna be using this in a sunny day, I would recommend one of those loops, bringing that with you, okay? The reputation of this camera is that it's the slowest focusing camera um, on, on, of the mirrorless cameras which it had a major firmware upgrade about a month ago that vastly increased the autofocus speed. However, it's still the slowest focusing. <laughs> I think it went from one to two seconds focusing speed to now just sort of uh, almost like a point and shoot. So almost like a bit of a shutter lag. Now again, some of us, I, I don't shoot a lot of action. I shoot a lot of buildings and sort of architecture. That's not moving much, you know? So, for me, you know, that, that autofocus speed is not as important. The, uh, the, it's got an APS-C size um, sensor in it, and the image quality is, is, is one of the best ones, I find. You know, it's getting that bigger sensor, so we can get better, higher ISOs, uh, nice dynamic range. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of that. Here we have a shot at 1600 ISO. When I tried to do um, this isn't an arty shot. I, I tried to fill the frame with shadow value, darks, as well as highlights. This is a shot like around noon. But at 1600, that's pretty clean. Okay? One stop up, 3200. Still very usable. You know? I mean, I'm starting to see something, some grain in here. The grain looks natural. You know, some of the grain doesn't look as natural. It looks a little too splotchy, but that, that, that actually, the noise looks like grain. It's starting to creep up into the highlights, but again, for 3200, it's still better than 3200 film ever was. <laughs> so, and then finally, I had to use a different image for 6400, and I kind of wanted, again, to show you the shadows and highlight areas. And at 6400, I mean, that's, I would say almost all, a lot of the cameras that we're going to talk about, 3200 is sort of that, that's as <laughs> far as I would feel comfortable with going. 6400, you could definitely work with this. We're starting to get grain everywhere, um, noise everywhere, but you would have to be aggressive for those of you using like Lightroom or Photoshop or Aperture. I would probably have to go like 30 to 50 points, you know, uh, uh, raising the, the noise reduction in that. So, which the noise reduction softens the image, so it's always that fine line of, of where do we play it. However, you know, maybe what you're shooting kind of should look dirty or should look noisy. You know, we can oftentimes this grain noise can make things look gritty. Okay? 
All right, going alphabetically, the Fuji Film X series, okay? They have um, the XE one and the X Pro one, um, and they just recently added the XM one, but I'm gonna really focus on the XE and the X uh, Pro one. They both have the same sensor, very unique 16 megapixel X trans CMOS sensor, okay? Um, the, um, what's unique about their sensor um, is unlike any other sensor out on the market, everyone else uses a Bayer style sensor, which a Bayer style sensor means red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue on the pixels. They're all in a very you know, rigid array. Fuji kind of looked back to their film, you know, and some of the best films out there sort of had a random array. Okay, so that's sort of where the X trans kind of comes in. It's not always going to be red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. They'll be red, they'll be green, they'll be blue, but not always in the same order. And this, cr it creates two things. A, the Bayer style sensor, you needed to put a filter over it, an anti-aliasing filter over it, which inherently softens our image quality a little bit. We can obviously, either in the camera or post, up our sharpening to, to make it better. But the Fujifilm, there's no need, because of this new X-Trans sensor, you don't need to put an anti-lazing filter on it. So kind of like the D800E, right, that also doesn't have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the filter over it, it's gonna be sharper out of the box. The images are gonna be, look sharper out of the box. So that's a nice thing. I've noticed when i um, working on my images on post, a lot of times I'm ha I have to sharpen my images somewhere between on a regular camera, somewhere between 40 to 60, depending upon the image. But the Fujis, I'm usually 30 to 40. Okay, so I have to sharpen less for it because it's sharper out of the box. So that's a really great feature on it. Also, just sort of that random array creates a different sort of depth to the image, almost like a, a little bit more realistic depth to it. Okay, um, APS-C 1.5, uh, as we talked about. Uh, they use contrast detection focus only, okay? The, um, again, their mount, it's a brand new mount. It's called the X mount. There are many adapters, like I said. You can put Leica lenses, Nikon lenses, all sorts of lenses on it. But they have their, uh, their own mount, which is called the X mount. Their ISO range is 200 to 6400, okay? And they have a fixed screen. Um, either a three inch or 2.8 inch. So here's the two um, cameras right here. This is the X1 Pro, and then this is the XE. I have the grip on the X Pro, which kind of adds a little bit to the bottom and a little bit better grip on the side. I, I, I prefer that, it does make it bigger. Um, and then let's talk about the really, there's only, there's not a f many differences between the two cameras. Um, there, uh, finally, there's no stabilization in the camera. They do have it in select lenses. Um, and then let's talk briefly about the price. XE1 is uh, either $799 body only or $1199 with their 18 to 55 zoom lens. That came out in September 2012. Their uh, X1, X-Pro1 is $1199 body only and that came out a little bit earlier that year in January 2012. Here's sort of a little difference of the overlay of the XE over the X Pro. Um, so better bokeh, better, bigger sensor. The, the basic, the main difference between these is uh, viewfinder. Okay, the X Pro one has the hybrid optical or electronic viewfinder that you can toggle between. <laughs> the XE one has a electronic viewfinder only. It has one of the best electronic viewfinders in the market it's got the most dots in it, most millions of dots, 2.36 in an OLED viewfinder. The XE also has a built-in flash. The X-Pro does not. They both have hot shoes, and they both have flashes in their system you can get. So the size difference is a little bit because we shaved off the, that sort of hybrid viewfinder. The um, XE one is a little bit smaller and weighs about three ounces less. Okay, but they both have the same sensor. You'll both get that same really nice image quality out of them. Let's look at their system. 
These are definitely the, uh, probably the, the, or these, this is the most retro camera out there. Okay? And that's sort of becoming a little thing right now. We'll see a couple of the other companies kind of jumping on with it. And it kind of fits. You know, it, these cameras, they're making these look like those old range finders, you know, starting from the 30s all the way up to the 70s. You know, th there were these really cool range finders that were smaller in size. So it kind of harkens and looks like an old Leica. It's simple and it's solid. Like someone was up here playing with the camera and they're like, how do I adjust this? Well, this one, you look at your lens, there's your apertures. And look at this, there's your shutter speeds right there. <laughs> this button is for my ISO. I don't need much more than that. I think you'll, if you, a camera like this, you'll go into right at the beginning, set your sort of your parameters you like, and you'll very rarely have to dig into the menu. And that's one of the reasons why I um, really enjoy this camera, is that we're not digging through menus. Everything is just right there for you. Um, their lens system is made up mostly of primes. They do have two. Um, they have two uh, zoom lenses, an 18 to 55, and then 55 to 200. They just kind of came out with this one, just released the beginning of the summer. And this is kind of a big one, but 55 to 200. And I just want to say, um, these are typical zoom ranges of sort of kit, like beginning entry level SLRs. But come up here and, and feel these afterwards, because these are very solidly made. Excellent glass is in here. And these are, de these are, I would not consider these kit lenses, okay? I would just consider them excellent zooms. They're both fat, much faster oftentimes. A 55 to 200 is gonna be like a four to six three on it. And this one is a three five to four eight. Okay, so it's letting more light in. Okay, keeping those apertures wider. Uh, this one I believe is 899 for the 55 to 200. Most of their lenses are, are very sort of economically, they're right in that sort of 500, like 599 to 899 price range. So nothing over, they do not sell anything over 100, or over 1,000. Um, so that's a really nice, and you can kind of see this is sort of a, a selection of what they have right now, the adapters. Uh, they have these ergonomic kits that you can kind of put on them, but they're also like a gateway drug to old Leica and, uh, <laughs> and Voigtlander lenses. You know, they kind of really fit and look like they belong on those cameras. Um, this is sort of, the, the, I said I have the grip and then they make a small flash. I have an old um, Nikon SB30, which is a manual little flash. That's what I put on there, okay? So if you have a manual flash, you can put anything on there. That's not, I, so this is my personal camera, the X-Pro1, okay? I, this is the one when I, when I said I, I lost my camera. The, and this was one of the first ones that came out and I kind of matched up with it. Um, and a discovery um, that I found that is that this is probably the best, um, and I'll say mirrorless, as well as DSLR camera for night photography. Okay, not many people are talking about it, but I've been shooting with this a lot at night, and this is the only camera that'll let us get beyond sort of that, the six to eight minute exposures. This can take up to an hour exposure without the need for noise reduction which no other camera has comes close to that. So um, if you, you know, you see me, you can follow the blog, you can see a lot of pictures that I took with this at night. So video, it's a little lacking on it. Um, the XE one is a little bit better for video for the main reason that it has a mini jack built in and so you can put on either the Fuji mic or another mic on there that has a mini adapter. The X-Pro1 is not the best and if you're gonna be shooting video in it, I would, I would only shoot manual focus on it as well. And then a new happening is uh, Zeiss. Zeiss who's been making manual focus lenses for, um, for Hasselblad, for, um, for now for DSLRs and for cinematography for many, many years, are making their first autofocus <laughs> lenses. And they're making them for the Fuji X mount and they're making them for the Sony NEX mount. As of right now, there are two current models. There's the 32 1.8, which is about a 50 millimeter, okay? And then they have a 12 millimeter 2.8, which would be a super wide 18 millimeter. I believe this one is around $900, and the 12 millimeter 2.8 is, I believe, it's around $1,100, okay? So that's when they're, the Zeiss brings up the, 
the value of the lenses. But I've been shooting with these, and these are phenomenal lenses. For the image quality, there's a reason why they say Zeiss is nice. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of their, let's look at the image quality here. So here we have 1600, okay? I personally think the Fuji wins the uh, Dynamic Range Award. It's really a smooth between the, uh, there's a smooth graduation between the highlights and the shadows on it. There's 1600, which hardly seems like anything. Here's 3200, where well, again we'll see a little, just a very little bit of, uh, of noise in the shadow area, but it looks very natural. It looks like grain. Um, it looks like film. We see it starting to creep in a little bit um, into uh, the highlight area. And then finally at 6400. Again, I would feel comfortable 3200 with this 6400. I would do in a pinch, but know that I would need to probably be a little bit aggressive in my noise reduction post. All right, let's move on to the Nikon 1 series. Um, Nikon 1, they have, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you three, but I'm really gonna focus on their, uh, the one camera, which is their V2 camera. Uh, their other ones are consumer, but I guess it was just easy to talk about them all. Um, October uh, 2012 was when the V1 came, uh, V2 uh, came out. Um, that is uh, around 1046 for a two lens kit or 1196 for the 10 to 100 kit. And they, again, they have rebates going on until the end of this month. Um, the, there's the J3 and now the new S1, okay, which are a little bit smaller, almost get rid of that electronic viewfinder that's on it. You have your choice of either 10 or 14 megapixels, 14 for the, the higher end one, the V2. They have their own sensor size and mount. It is a, the smallest of the mirrorless that I consider, the one inch CMOS sensor, and a wonderful math 2.7 conversion factor. Love that. <laughs> Incredibly fast um, hybrid or contrast detect, uh, hybrid contrast phase detect autofocusing. Um, again, the Nikon CX mount, the ISO range from 100 to 3200. A fixed three inch screen and no stabilization in body, it would be in select lenses. This, the, the, these cameras I would probably are, uh, I would consider, especially the J, uh, the J3 and the S1. This is, if you don't have a point and shoot camera and you really want the simplicity of a point and shoot camera, the size and a better image quality. I think these, these two cameras offer that and a lot of features in that. Um, the V2 is a little bit, is, is, is definitely a step better. You get a nice grip, you get the pop-up flash as well as you can add an external flash to it, um, but in the same system. So the, the differences begin between them for the, uh, these are the, uh, the S1 and the J3, 10 or 14 megapixel accordingly. Um, pop-up flash. Um, and screen size, or so pop-up flash only, no, no, no hot shoe. Okay, hot shoe over here. The uh, screen resolution is going to be uh, double that in the J3, and then the weight is pretty much the same. They both shoot at uh, about 15 frames a second. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty quick. The um, the V2 has a really a, a very nice electronic viewfinder. Uh, of 1.5 million dots, 14 megapixel external flash options, very er ergonomic. That's the one I brought here. Uh, has really comfortable in the hand, small. You know, it looks bigger on screen, right? <laughs> but really comfortable with the grip. I like when the companies kind of either offer you the grip or add that grip onto it. So very ergonomically friendly. You can see the, the flash, smaller flash. And these are the, this is the two lens kit. Okay, here's our 10 to 30. Okay, and here's our 30 to 110, or they have a 10 to 1, uh, they have a, a 10 to 110 if you don't want to change the lenses. All right, system and thoughts on this one. This one is blazingly fast. Okay, so um, if, you're, if you're a soccer mom or dad, this is a pretty good camera for you, you know, if you want to capture that kind of stuff. It has a maximum shutter of six, one sixteen thousandth of a second. 
Most, most pro cameras top out at eight thousandths of a second, right? And this is also where um, smaller sensor, no mirror, you know, to, to get it out of the way, and no, no, uh, there is no shutter trail on it. This has just an open shutter, okay? Has a really unique, interesting feature called motion snapshot, which basically you'll take a, it'll only shoot it for, I believe, one to three seconds, but it'll make it a slow motion movie for you with that one to three seconds. Very interesting, I think a creative uh, idea filter. Um, 400 or 12,000 frames per second in a slow motion video. So again, a lot of video options here, a lot of fast action uh, capture here. 1080 or 60i or 1030 30p for the video. Time lapse features 60 frames per second continuous um, on it. You guys come up here um, at the end and, and hit that trigger. It's like it's kind of cool. You definitely won't miss, miss a shot. Like I said, it does have the smallest sensor size, the one inch sensor. Um, but again, I think now this camera is, is for those people who really don't want maybe as serious of a camera, but they want something better than a point and shoot. They do have the adapter if you have Nikon lenses to go into this system as well. Uh, but again, they tend to be a little bit top heavy, okay? Now because of the small sensor, this definitely, um, you'll, and you'll see in here, even 1600, it's kind of, the whole image is kind of grainy. I really wouldn't go much past 800 on this sensor. Probably 1600 would be my, I'll get out, I'll get out of jail on this one with some, with some, uh, over, with some uh, noise reduction. There's 1600. There's 3,200, okay, we can kind of, we see a lot of noise in here, just all over. It's almost like a, like a speckled painting, right? And then 6,400 is definitely a no-go. <laughs> you know, you can start to see the magenta cast come in and just overall. So, what this camera is not, is not for the high ISO, ultimate blow up image quality of 17 by 22, especially in low light. But what it is, this is a great camera to capture your family, to capture your kids, to just capture that sort of quick action. That's where this really excels at. Any questions on the Nikon One? Okay. We'll move on to the Olympus OMD. Okay. This one, um, they were one of also the first ones to kind of join in the retro design. How many people remember the Olympus uh, pen cameras back in the day, the half frames? Really, really cool camera that, you know, in this late 60s, early 70s, kind of took the industry by storm by, by creating these half frames. And it was the half the size of a 30, 35 millimeter um, film. So you get 72 shots as opposed to 36. It took you almost forever to finish a roll sometimes, it seemed. But they can make, and they were all metal design. They were like these small, solid little gems. Uh, right, and you could, the Canon also. Yeah. Yeah. So the pen camera definitely had its following, and it was really, um, I think when Olympus kind of jumped back into the digital game, uh, a lot of people were saying, oh, are they going to make, you know, they, the two retro cameras from Olympus were their pen cameras and their OM series, mm -hmm. which were kind of like the old Nikon FM cameras, just these small, you know, solidly built, you know, cameras. And Olympus, even back then, they were really known for making the smallest, toughest camera out there. And so they went back sort of to that. They came out with their pen series camera which is now at the, at the uh, EP5, and we're gonna talk about that one. That's one of the, the latest ones. But really, their flagship is the OMD. Um, came out in February 2012. It's 899 body only, 999 with their 14 to 42 lens, or 1149 with a 12 to 50 lens. 16 megapixel live MOS sensor. Um, it is part of the micro four thirds mount, which has the 2X conversion factor. So again, 50 millimeter equals 100 millimeter, easy, we like that math. It uses contrast as well as phase, uh, that hybrid autofocus. The ISO range is from 200 to 25,600, okay? It has a three inch tilt touch screen. Let's see, where is it? Right here. 
It really is small. It def these always look bigger on But here's the, uh, the tilt screen, as well as the electronic viewfinder built in, okay? It comes with a little tiny flash that really is, you know, not good for much, but uh, it has the hot shoe that you can put the bigger flashes on as well. It has a very unique five axis image stabilization. So good luck finding an axis that you're not covered in. <laughs> so ba basically, it, and it's solid, it really is. You know, they kind of really um, took, you know, it to, to went back, heart, really harkened back in the retro design, but didn't make it plasticky. It's, it's got a lot of metal in it, so very, very well designed. And actually, you can um, uh, run it underwater. It's, it's, it's waterproof, durable, or splash proof. Don't go swimming with it. Um, like we said at the beginning, Olympus, with, as, as well as Panasonic, were right there at the beginning. So now they're in their eighth generation of making these mirrorless cameras. So they really have a good grasp of it and they've gotten feedback from you know their customers and the market and are applying it to it. Um, the electronic viewfinder is 1.4 uh, million uh, pixels in it with a very fast 120 frames per second refresh rate. Their uh, processor is called the uh, TruePix 6 um, and it is incredibly fast and uh, well, they're auto-focusing, it sort of has this 3D tracking. So this one, Olympus, is also one of the better ones for sports, okay? For definitely following and tracking that fast moving stuff, because it has that 3D tracking, and it goes up to nine frames per second. Okay, like I said, for the most part, it does have that little flash, but it is a, um, a pop-up one for the most part. They have a vast system, okay? They, especially when you add that they have the same mount as Panasonic, now you have probably over 50 lenses that you could choose from. A lot of primes, a lot of zooms. One's Olympus makes great glass. Panasonic has Leica making glass for them. Voigtlander, Sigma, all these companies are making lenses for them. So you really have a lot to choose from. There's also many adapters um, to fit into like a old other Olympus, old Olympus, or other brand cam uh, lenses that you might have, okay? Olympus makes audio recorders. They're one of the best uh, at making, actually, these compact audio recorders. And they apply that audio technology into this camera as well. So it's got either great, one of the best onboard mics, but also it has great um, little smaller mics that you can add to it. So if you're recording video, it does a pretty good job at recording video, but also, you know, vi video is nothing without audio. <laughs> okay. Now, just announced, uh, or early this summer, we saw the announcement and then the release of the EP5. I saw someone here had the EP1, right? And so this is the latest one of it. I actually bought the EP1 when it came out, um, and I liked it. It w I liked the design of it. I got it in white. <laughs> um, but I was kind of frustrated with the image quality. The smaller set kind of suffered a little bit with, from, the, from the, that really nice image quality. Also for night photography, it was very difficult because if you do night photography, if you're just relying upon the back of the screen or electronic viewfinder, if it's dark, it's dark. Whereas like the Fuji with the optical viewfinder, I'm still able to see a little bit what's going on. However, this EP5 looks very, very intriguing, okay? Comes at a price point $9.99 body only or $14.99 with the, with, the, with the electronic viewfinder and a, this really cool fixed 17 1.8 lens. It's like a 34 1.8 lens. So really, it's a cool lens. Um, it's got the same, it's taken a lot of the same pro features that are in the OMD it has 68 megapixels, same sensor. It's got built-in Wi-Fi and GPS. It has, someone asked me about, what about the remote releases? And this was one of, this is kind of what's happening in the industry, is remote release with a smartphone, okay? Fuji actually uses the old school cable releases, those $8 ones, and I love that, right? Because we all probably have one or two, we just gotta find them in the drawer or the closet. But most of us have a smartphone, and what a lot of the companies are doing now is they are giving you a free app that can now control 
when you want to trigger, you just open up, take the picture, control it from your phone. So that's where, where sort of things are going now. So losing or the, the, the uh, cable releases that take batteries, you won't have to worry about it. Of course, it'll drain more energy from your, your phone, but um, a lot of dials, a lot of functions. They have these two by two custom control dials. Olympus is definitely a little bit more menu driven than some of the others, especially their pen. The OMD is a little less, but you kind of have to dig through their menu and it definitely takes some time to get used to. As a night photography, this is one feature that I am very interested in. Um, they're the first ones to ha come out with this. It's called the live bulb with histogram. Basically, as you take, say I'm doing a, you know, a night shot and it's difficult for me to see because it's electronic viewfinder in a really dark scene, but I can trigger it and the image will start appearing on the back of the screen as well as a histogram. So I can stop it when it looks right on the back of the screen or when that histogram gets to an area where I'm comfortable with. Really, really cool function and feature for, uh, for those of us who are doing a lot of night photography. So let us look at, uh, this is, a, I tested, I haven't been able to get my hands on an EP5. I have the EPL5 here today, which is sort of uh, one stop down from it. You know, it's a little bit more plastic body, a little bit smaller. Doesn't have the cool live bulb feature. Came out about, uh, I believe, um, early this year. Um, but it's going to be about the same size. And again, you can kind of see, get a handle of that. Let's look at the image quality. This is the smallest sensor that I tested that I was very impressed with. This is the OMD, which would be, the, again, the same sensor in the OMD as in the EP5. OK, so you'll see this same. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes, you're right. Yep. So um, here it is at 1600, and this is very clean. Really, really smooth in here. You know, shadows look good. Highlights, no, no encroachment in the highlights. Here it is at 3200. <laughs> And we're starting to see some grain in the shadows, but it's very natural looking. You know, it's a really good, really good image. And then at 6,400, I think, again, it, it does a good job. I would stick away, you know, we can kind of just see it's kind of painted with, with, the, uh, with the grain and the noise. But it does, a, it, it does a good job of handling it. I don't see any, any fringing or magenta so, with the highlights. So that's a, that's a nice testament right there. Panasonic, the, uh, again, the first mirrorless camera that, uh, that came out in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, their flagship is the Lumix GH3, which has a 16 megapixel live MOS sensor. It has four CPU Venus engine, so really, really great processor. It also takes the micro four thirds mount, which has the two times uh, conversion factor. It uses contrast detect and full area autofocus. It does not use a hybrid, but the contrast detect is one of the best contrast detect focuses out there. It is really fast and focusing. Uh, ISO 200 to 12,800 range, a three inch fully articulated OLED monitor with static touch control. That does not mean you get static electricity with it. <laughs> um, it was just announced in March 2013. Um, and uh, it is uh, $12.98 body only. So a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit on the pricier side. It is also one of the biggest of the mirrorless cameras. It is almost as big as a Rebel, like a Canon Rebel. <coughs> okay, so it's like, I don't know why, they, but they add a lot, I guess they add a lot of uh, features. It does have a nice grip. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one of, us, one of these to play with, nor have I tested this myself. I am only going upon I have several videographer friends who have used this and have been very pleased with this um, camera. This camera really competes um, pretty much with the 5D Mark III with video. Okay, and let's think about it. Panasonic was first a video company. They're one of the leaders in the sort of the video world. So they are really keen on putting a lot of that technology into their uh, digital cameras, their digital still cameras. Uh, professional HD video up to 1080p, 60 frames per second at H2.64 format. Time code support for the video. 
uh, for those of us who are doing the videos. Um, it has a very rugged body, sealed magnesium alloy. It has the electronic viewfinder. You look at that camera and you think it's going to be, again, an SLR, but it's electronic viewfinder. Six frames per second continuous shooting. It has Wi-Fi built in and it has a pop-up flash as well as the hot shoe for external flashes. Um, full area, that again, that autofocus um, is that full area for video and for stills, and it is really, really fast. It's, again, one of the biggest and the heaviest. And sort of this chart, I don't understand a lot of this, but a lot of videographers do. <laughs> it's basically a lot of sort of the, uh, the inputs and outputs, the bit rates, time code, all that it can kind of compete with. And this, again, is a, is a chart that kind of competes um, with, again, the 5D Mark III. Let's take a look at the system and thoughts. Um, this, again, like Olympus, has a vast dedicated system, over 50 lenses shared by Olympus, Panasonic, um, Voigtlander, et cetera, et cetera. They have a, um, several Leica X lenses. Okay, and they're gonna be definitely over $1,000. You know, they make their kit lenses, and then they make their high-end lenses. So Leica X lenses are super nice. Optical image stabilization. Um, it, again, like I said, this is the biggest of the mirrorless and competes kind of with the 5D Mark III. You can kind of see a selection of their flashes and mics and uh, battery grips. And then just announced, because Panasonic is one of the companies that they have about five or six different types of mirrorless. So what we're looking at is their top of the line. And then the GX7 is probably gonna kinda come in as number two. And this is in a much smaller um, size um, rate. It has a uh, just announced, probably due in the end of September, early October. Um, 1099 with the 14 to 42 version two lens, 16 megapixel CMOS sensor, um, in camera, their image stabilization like Olympus built in camera. Um, fast and accurate contrast detect. Okay, so they're not going hybrid, they're sticking with contrast and they're doing a darn good job of it. ISO is, goes from 200 to 25,600. It has a three inch tilting LCD and the first that I've ever seen of a flip up EVF screen as you can kind of see right there, kind of tilts up and up. So you can almost look like, I guess if you had really good eyes, probably look at, use it as like sort of a, a, almost a, a viewfinder looking down into. Um, it has, no, it has uh, Wi-Fi as well, and it, everything looks good on this, but the big uh, head-scratcher is that there is not a spot for an external mic. Panasonic, with all of its video technology, for some reason, decided not to put a mini port in here. So, if you're a photographer, just going to be shooting stills, great camera. If you're a video, if you want to do video too and get really good audio, that's, that's a, that is a game breaker, you know? That just kind of, and that's not something, you know, that can be addressed with a firmware upgrade. That's a hardware upgrade, is, is getting that hole. So, so that's sort of a, a little bit of a head scratcher. We'll find out more about that, of course, and an get those questions answered when it comes out in October. An underrated and not that heard about company that's been making definitely some big waves in the photo industry, and especially in mirrorless, is Samsung. How many of you people have uh, droid cameras, uh, droid phones? Well, it's all Samsung, right, for the most part? So they've been, they, Samsung has been actually making a lot of technology, TVs, cameras, all these bits and parts, but they have not been putting their label to it. For the past like five years, they kind of teamed up with Pentax, and now they're working with Schneider. Um, and, and kind of making great glass and great electronics and putting that into camera technology. So the two cameras really to talk about are the NX300, which is the small one. We have this one over here. Real nice small design. <coughs> NX300 or the, NX, or the NX20 right here. A little bit more of an SLR looking one, but, but still petite. Okay. The, uh, they have Schneider lens, uh, glass in a lot of their lenses. Um, for those of you, Schneider was one of the big glass manufacturers from the beginning. Um, really, really great lenses. 
Their ISO range is going to be 100 to 12,800 or 25,600, depending upon the camera model. Um, Samsung is one of the best for Wi-Fi. Of course, they're one of the Android leaders, so getting that sort of built-in Wi-Fi, getting a lot of those electronics built in, they're doing a darn good job of that. Um, stabilization is will be in the lens, and so it's only optical and select lenses. Let's take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, the uh, NX3 uh, 300 is going to be 798 to 899 with this. They can make a di couple different kits. They have a very interesting uh, 2D, 3D, 45 1.8 lens. So it's, one, it's actually a true uh, 3D lens that you could put on fixed focal length, 45 millimeter. Um, but you know, if you want to make that mini avatar, that's a good way to go. <laughs> Hybrid autofocusing in the NX300, a 3.3 inch tilting touchscreen. Um, quite light at under 10 ounces and no pop-up flash. Okay, it does have a hot shoe, so you could add external flashes. Uh, smarter and quicker with the uh, Dreamy 4 engine. The uh, NX20 has come down significantly in price. Again, this camera is a little over a year old. It's $599. Okay, the electronic viewfinder or the tilt swivel, um, three inch fully articulating screen. It has that nice grip, a little bit bigger grip, so it handles like a DSLR. Uses contrast detect on the sensor. Eight, one eight thousandth of, of a second is their maximum shutter, so that's a quick one. Can capture that, those, that action shots. And it's a little bit heavier at the 12 ounces. Um, is that the only one with the articulating screen? I you know, I believe so, with that sort of full articulation like that. A lot of them have the drop down, look up. And the GH3. Stuff. And the GH3, right, the GH3. Panasonic GH3 and the Samsung NX20. Which is the Panasonic That's all depends. <laughs> I mean, I, I would probably... The question is, which of the Samsungs is better? I would probably, if anything, um, unless you like the articulating screen, unless you like the, the better grip, the newer technology is always kind of the way to go with the smaller NX300, probably. Again, the full system of thoughts. They have a wide array of lenses and, and accessories to choose from. They, are, again, are smart. The, Samsung is a smart... Uh, cameras, Android system. So again, they have a lot of apps to do their remote triggers, as well as they'll do a lot of firmware upgrading. Um, incredibly user-friendly menu, really um, kind of taking from that phone technology about, you know, no one reads a manual for a phone, right? So they kind of make their menu very kind of <coughs> bright and shiny, easy to look at, but also kind of it just makes sense. So that's nice. Comfortable to hold on well, both of them. The uh, NX300 has less of a grip but the uh, NX20 has a nice grip. Uh, again, that 2D, 3D lens, and they're a global leader in digital technologies. You know, um, With all the Wi-Fi, you can instantly post these images to Facebook or the videos to YouTube and stuff like that. So very, very cool uh, features. Let's take a look at their image quality. APS-C size sensor, so we sh it should be pretty good. Um, and 1600 looks good to me. Uh, it's a little bit warmer if we're kind of comparing it to some of the other images, uh, Samsung tends to be run a little on the warm side of it. Um, but at 1600, we're still looking pretty clean in those shadows. 3200 is uh, definitely uh, the noise is starting to creep up. Still workable. Um, I would shoot at 3200, no problem. 6400, we could get away with it. You know, I mean, it is again going to be that look, but it, it handles it well. Um, and again, this has no noise reduction on it, so you could lessen it a little bit with noise reduction. Okay, last camera to or last camera system to look at, and probably one of the more exciting, uh, probably one of the most exciting ones, and a, really a leader, is the Sony and the Sony NEX series. Okay, you have, and we're going to look at the Sony. Um, mainly going to focus on the six and the seven, uh, which very similar. Uh, 6 is 16 megapixels, 7 is 24 megapixels, CMOS sensor, APS-C size, so again, nice big sensor. The uh, Sony's are very ergonomic. Um, you can see I have both of them right here. You just got this nice grip 
for you to hold on to. So really nice. Um, the both the six and the seven have electronic viewfinders as as well as L, as well as a tilting LCD. Okay, three inches. ISO range is 100 to 25 uh, to 25,600. Um, and stabilization you're going to find in the lenses. Okay, and it would be select lenses. Right now there's some great rebates about 100 or 150 dollars on both the. Uh, uh, not the seven, but the sixes are and, and under. Um, seven is a little, it's a little old. It's one of the oldest cameras that we have here, August 2011. Okay? Uh, whereas the six came out a year later, August 2012. Uh, we're also, uh, the, f uh, the five, which is also a contender I have up here, the, uh, the NEX5, 598. Right now the six is 798, and the seven is 1248. Okay, and those rebates are good from 8 to 8 till the end of this month. So here's sort of a, a, a further breakdown. The 5 is really an advanced entry level. Um, it has contrast, as, uh, contrast and phase detection. 3 inch, 180 degree tilting touchscreen. It goes all the way up. Um, no viewfinder, no viewfinder options on the 5. Okay. Um, and you ha it has a basically a uh, small add-on flash. So no viewfinder options and no uh, hot shoe for flash options. So you're limited to those. Um, it's uh, nice, and, nice and light, 9.74 ounces. Now the 6 and the 7, really the main difference is the megapixel and the construction, there's definitely more magnesium alloy. The 7 is a little tougher, a little, little heavier, a little more solid. But I'm, I tell you something, I've been using the 6 now for about 6 months, and it, it feels fine to me. I haven't, and I don't treat my cameras pristinely. <laughs> um, standard dials, uh, they have Wi-Fi, and so the, the 7 has a tri-nav. It has a little couple more dials that you can kind of program and, and assign. Um, Contra the 6 has contrast, that hybrid contrast and phase detection, whereas the 7 only has contrast. Um, they both have a high resolution, 2.3 uh, 2 million e electronic viewfinder. The 6 is a bit of a game changer because for the first time in the history of Sony, they actually put a normal hot shoe on a camera, something that will accept pocket wizards or almost any sort of standard mount. Sony bought Minolta's technology, camera technology, and they used this very, let's call it unique, <laughs> mount that was for their flashes, and it's, that's the only thing that mounts to it. Uh, I don't have one here to show you, but it kind of mo looked more like that. And so it was very difficult to mount other things. You want to put a bubble level on top. You want to put a pocket wizard on top. It was impossible. So it looks like Sony is moving forward with using the standard size hot shoe and that a lot of uh, they're also putting making it a, almost what they call in a smart shoe because you can put microphones directly into there and it'll be uh, right in there. So also they're uh, using they're one of the leaders with the Wi-Fi and apps um, and kind of like the Olympus, the Sony definitely is a little bit more menu driven. Okay, you're going to have to, there are some buttons and stuff that we can assign here, but it's a very Blade Runner-esque menu, <laughs> a very futuristic menu in there. So you kind of have to dig in there a little bit more uh, to find it. So unlike the Fuji, like I said, the Fuji kind of got the aperture shutter speeds right there. This one we have to just remember which dials it is. They do have a touch screen. The three, the three, but not the six. Yeah. So we'll see it hopefully in the next year. The system and thoughts. Uh, again, Zeiss is nice. So they had been working with uh, Zeiss earlier. Zeiss is making some of their lenses and a lot of their point shoot cameras. Um, and they do make one Zeiss lens. A, uh, I believe it's a uh, 35 millimeter equivalent 1.8. Really nice lens, a little big. And then of course, like I said, the two new Zeiss branded lenses will fit onto here as well. Um, uh, has a, this really? The, this is one of the better kit lenses that I've seen. It's a power zoom. So as we turn it on, it kind of it has a small uh, frame, but as we turn it on, it gets bigger. And it's a nice zoom range. It's a 16 to 50, so like a 24 
to 75. So it's a little bit, little bit wider than, than some of the others. So I, 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 like, I like that. Um, the, uh, obviously, Sony is a leader in the video world. So they have a lot of good video functionality as well. Nice video uh, capture, as well as a lot of audio components that you can add to it. Um, they, Sony builds their own sensors. So that, that's a good thing when we can kind of control it from the, from the beginning. Um, and we can kind of see some of the other adapters, um, optical viewfinders if you need it, um, and mics and such. And they have, again, their, their, their lens range is growing and growing. Let's take a look at their image quality. Here we are at 1600, which really looks nice. Uh, 3200. I think, for me, you know, the Sony ekes out the best ISO award. You know, that's looking pretty good. There's nothing, and the highlights, I don't see, I hardly see any noise in the highlights here. It's definitely in the shadows, but that's where you'd expect to see it, and it's well retained in the shadows. A little bit more contrasty if we compare it to some of the other ones. Like I said, the Fuji I, I, and the Olympus, I was able to see under here. So they're kind of crushing their blacks a little bit. So not di the best dynamic range, but the ISOs are very well maintained. And 6400 is also looks really nice. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.